With every new piece of news regarding Dragon's Dogma 2, it looks to be even better. Now, I've said it before, I have my reservations about the game, and I still do, but every time we see something more, we get hints and teases of what this game is, and I become more of a full-fledged believer. And while we got the State of Play trailer, I think there's some other very interesting tidbits that people might be missing or that they haven't really put two and two together. Because this game looks to be ticking all of my boxes, especially when it comes to things like missable content, which is one of my favorite things in games that we rarely see anymore. But at the same time, it seems to be introducing a lot of different accessibility features that I think will make it a little bit better for newcomers to the series. So, hi, I'm Mug Thief. I make videos on the internet about things I care about, and we're going to talk about Dragon's Dogma 2 and all of the little tidbits that show us what we can expect. Now, some of the information that we have now comes from a couple of sources after the trailer from State of Play that you're seeing on screen now. In that trailer, they revealed the Warfarer vocation, which are classes in this game. And the Warfarer is a jack of all trades, but master of none, just like you might expect. They can use bows, magic, and swords, but they're not proficient. They're not masters at any of them. And the penalty for it are that the stats are lowered in each of those areas to make them not masters, not be able to pump out the best of each. And this is really, really interesting, not just because of its existence, but because of what it implies for the design of the game. Now, firstly, to get it out of the way, this is a really exciting point that we now have confirmed that there are a lot more vocations than we thought. How many more? We don't know, but we're not going to see the same number that we saw in Dragon's Dogma 1. We already suspected this with the existence of the trickster. Since each vocation is categorized by the colors it has, and the hybrid vocations have colors that mix the two vocations they come from, we knew that the trickster didn't match with anything that we knew in advance. And with the recent IGN kind of podcast preview they did, they don't know where it comes from either. But the rest of vocations come from vocation masters who set you on a quest, you get the weapon for that vocation, and when you turn it in, you can now access it. The Warfarer just continues to confirm this idea that there's a lot more vocations than what we think. And I'm really excited to see how crazy they go with these and how overpowered in progression you can get, because that's one of the design tenets of the original Dragon's Dogma, is everything becomes overpowered eventually. But the Warfarer is very curious, because Giving access to all three of these main types of attacks to a character definitely feels like something done with accessibility and for FOMO players in mind. Hey, you don't want to lock yourself into a specific route because what if playing with the bow and magic is cool and you don't just want to use a sword? Well, here's a class that does it, but they have been very specific in saying that to maximize the potential of the Warfarer, you need to evenly distribute and use all of the different methods you have available. It's not good enough to say, well, I'm a swordsman, but sometimes I use magic. No, you really need to take advantage of all of the things at your disposal to come close to what a dedicated vocation can do. So while it is a step towards accessibility and making players feel like they don't miss out, it's also its own unique brand of Jack of all trades. That's some really smart design in my opinion. But my question is more how much that accessibility idea will carry forward throughout the rest of the game. Will we be able to just continuously change vocations and continue to get overpowered, similarly to how we could in Dragon's Dogma 1 with the different enhancements in each vocation that carried over when you switched? And how would that impact something like the Warfarer? Will I be able to max out all my stats in the specific vocations, and then when I switch to Warfarer because all of my stats are super high, I'm now just the most overpowered thing in the world, or are they going to limit that? Will they let us go absolutely crazy if we're willing to put in the time to grind up to those sorts of things, or do they want to keep us more or less under control? And how does that relate when we're talking about switching vocations regularly? Will our stats always be redistributed? when we switch in other vocations. Because that would be nice for people who want to try other vocations out and don't want to feel like 
They're being punished for having picked wrong on the first go around, but also would limit that possibility of creating a super character, right? I think accessibility generally is a good thing, though. It needs to be carefully balanced, because I'm not in favor or against either of these decisions. They both have their pros and cons. I kind of prefer the idea of creating a super character. I think that also leaves room for accessibility to some degree. But Dragon's Dogma is a large game. I will probably play it through once or twice to make my big analysis. I'll wait for DLC. Me and a lot of people don't want to play a game seven times over. So making sure that that first playthrough is something that most people will enjoy since it is what most people will do just that first playthrough, I think is valuable in creating a good experience. You just have to make sure that the accessibility doesn't take away from the particular magic of a game. And I trust Dragon's Dogma to do that as well, because there's a tidbit I had missed regarding the Sphinx. You see, we had that interview piece from IGN first about the Sphinx, but they say that if you miss the riddle, you can't do it anymore. I hadn't thought about this until I saw a tweet that said that the Dragon's Dogma 2 developers were absolutely cooking, because this is a game with, as far as we know, a single save slot, it auto-saves, and if you miss the riddle, you can't try again. Maybe there will be other ways to get the same rewards. Maybe some of that includes a different side quest that will allow you to fight the Sphinx. But theoretically, if you don't answer correctly, you're screwed. That is missable content at its core. That is what I love about video games of this type. These open worlds where each story is a little bit different because not everybody goes down the same path. And depending on which paths you go down, you will have a different story to tell. Which I guess also this serves as a warning. If you don't want to miss out on the Sphinx stuff, uh, maybe check a guide in advance so you don't get the riddle wrong. There's no shame in doing so. But this general philosophy of creating content that you can screw up and then never see. You can fail out of a quest and in this case it's the Sphinx, but what if it's a whole dungeon? What if it's whatever you might imagine? that you can just miss out on. That is how special, memorable games are made, in my opinion. And if you're going to talk about accessibility, being able to fail a quest and then having no option to do it again on this playthrough is wild. That is not accessibility at all. So if there's a balance that they're looking to strike, I'm feeling quite confident that they're nailing it. Now, there is a lot we haven't seen. And like I said at the start of the video, I am not completely 100% on Dragon's Dogma 2. I think it's going to be a great game that I will love, that I will cover, I will make my very big video analysis of it, because I'm a big fan of the first game, of Itsuno, and of Capcom. But that doesn't mean it's going to be a 10 out of 10. That doesn't mean it's going to be one of the greatest games ever made. And most of those reservations come from that, even though we've only seen from around the 10 first hours of the game, We've seen just a lot of forests, mountains, and deserts. And until this trailer, which, again, this is why each new trailer gets me more and more excited. We had just seen kind of a lot of trolls, to be honest. Maybe a griffin and a harpy. But now we're seeing more enemy variety. We got to see an actual dragon in Dragon's Dogma. That's nice. But doesn't confirm just how much content there's going to be in the game and locations and enemies. Because there's only so much of forest and desert that I can take before I say, well, these are the same enemies over and over again in the same 50 minutes of gameplay that we have available to us. Where are the crazy things? Where are the cooler enemies? Where is the large variety of them? Where are the unique locations that are fun to explore? How much content is in this game? And how cool is it going to be to experiment with it? Because for a game that keeps talking about how exploring is something that they really want to make feel amazing. And I am 100% in on this idea of the exploration being the thing that gets us all excited. I want to explore cool stuff and a large variety of it. We don't know how much is in the final game. And I am staying optimistic in thinking that this will not be tiring. This will not be the same landscapes that we have to prepare for and journey through over and over again in a way that might become tedious eventually when it's your 15th time running down the same path, but now to turn left at the end of it. 
I did do some extra digging in that new trailer, and in the background we can see a lot of cool structures and locations that look unique and fun to explore. I'm not going to do a full like trailer analysis or something, but my hopes are getting up. It's just I don't want to get them all the way up or something. But like I said at the top of the video, every extra detail we get from Dragon's Dogma gets me more and more excited for it. And I hope this continues, and as we continue to hear more about the game, I just continue to get more excited. I always try and temper my expectations, especially on games that I intend to review, because I want to be as fair as possible when analyzing them. But it's getting kind of hard to do with Dragon's Dogma 2. Anyways, I'm Mugthief. I hope this made you think a little bit, get excited for Dragon's Dogma 2. If you enjoyed the video and you're new here, remember to subscribe. It helps out the channel more than you imagine. There is plenty of videos coming really soon, and there's a huge backlog of those big analysis and other news on the channel right now that you can go check out. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you again very soon.